Thank you guys uh, for joining us today. Um, just some facts right at the top for you guys to mull over. In the past 12 months, uh, there have been 410 unique cookery titles aired on UK terrestrial TV. Uh, terrestrial channels have aired 87 days worth of cookery titles in the past year. Welcome, everybody, to Why We Love Food, the first in the uh, series of discussions hosted by the RTS on successful TV formats. Um, we want to discuss today what makes uh, food shows, TV formats so successful, and where they might be heading in the age of Netflix, social media, and other sort of media channels. Uh, my name is Pritesh Modi. I run a company called World of Zing. Um, Basically, I have a cocktail lab, which is pretty cool. But um, uh, I also regularly host the food and drinks section on Sunday brunch. So hangover TV. Um, uh, well, I've got a really cool panel here today. Um, all kinds of backgrounds. Um, and I will let you guys introduce yourself first. So starting off with Tanya. Hello, um, so I'm Tanya Shaw, I'm Managing Director of Shine Television and we make MasterChef. Um, and before that, I was a commissioning editor at the BBC um, where I worked with lots of uh, amazing chefs like uh, Rick Stein, Raymond Blanc, Mary Berry. And before that, I was a commissioning editor at Channel 4 uh, and commissioned um, some food programmes there as well, uh, like the Food Hospital, so sort of a variety of different food stuff. I won't say anything else about myself, just the, just the food stuff. <laughs> I think that's what you're interested in. Next up, Melissa. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Melissa Hemsley, and I started my food career about uh, 10 years, almost 10 years ago. I started private chefing for, for bands and actors. Um, anyone that wanted really delicious food and they wanted to feel energised and feel really good but didn't want to go on a diet. Um, and I had a TV show with my sister about three years ago. Um, and we have a cafe at Selfridges. I was just explaining it's, he hadn't been, so it was, I was saying it's by the lingerie department, if anyone's <laughs> headed up that way, um, and sportswear departments. Um, and I've written um, three cookery books, and I'm about to hand in, hopefully, after Bank Holiday Weekend, my next one, which is all about um, leftovers and uh, not throwing away food, which is exciting. Cool. Alicia? Hi, I'm Nisha Katona, and um, I had a bit of a strange journey into food. I was a barrister, child protection, for 20 years, um, but all the while I was obsessed with food, and while I was doing that, I wrote a cook, my first cookery book, and I started, <laughs> with the indignity, a, a YouTube channel um, to show people how to cook Indian food with a, a very simple formula. Um, I then, four years ago, four and a half years ago, started my first restaurant, um, mortgaging my house to the hilt to do so. Um, and I'm now on restaurant number, building my 12th restaurant, which is a miracle, Ooh, really. Wow. Um, I've just done a bit of filming, so I've just done recipes that made me. I've done Top of the Shop for the BBC. I do Sunday brunch sometimes with you. you um, and I've just done something with Fred um, filming in, in um, Santiago de Compostela. And an MBE. There is that as well. <laughs> that, I think, was a pity I want to make sure she said that. <laughs> I don't know. <mind. laughs> And Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah Lazenby. I'm Head of Features and Formats at Channel 4. Um, we commission, I look after the Bake Off franchise, so the Great British Bake Off, Bake Off the Professionals, Extra Slice, the forthcoming Junior Bake Off. We also have Sunday Brunch under us, um, Food Unwrapped, uh, all of Jamie's programmes, um, so Jamie's Quick and Easy, um, and Friday Night Feast, and... Uh, before that, I was I series produced lots of things like Jamie's Foul Dinners and Gordon Ramsay's F Word and Gordon's Cook Along Live, so a lot of food. <laughs> awesome. So to kick things off, um, I'm going to ask each of you, uh, what would you consider the most influential cookery format and why? Tanya, let's start with you. So I think there's a difference between formats and people that teach us how to cook and formats that we might watch for entertainment. And one of the brilliant things about food is there are so many different reasons why, why you might watch a food programme. But for me, I have picked Delia because I think um, she's just done so much. And whilst she's not on our screens at the moment, for decades, she really was the only person that um, taught anybody how to do anything. So uh, for me, it's Delia. The Delia effect is real still. Yeah. Right? Did um, you say at the moment? Because you know something. 
No, 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 no. I'm not a Christian editor anymore. I don't know um, no, I just think, but you know, for decades she yeah. really, she mm. just really influenced, you know, my generation, my parents' generation. She's the queen. And we've still got, you know, and I think she's going to influence the kind of the next generation Absolutely. as well because her books are just kind of classics. Absolutely. I think we've got a clip. Hello, hello again, and welcome to this week's programme. Over four decades, Delia Smith has single-handedly changed the way we shop, cook and eat. Brilliant. Um, next up, Melissa. Um, I, I said, uh, ready, steady, cook. Um, I used to race home. Did anyone ever watch, like... Ready, steady, cook, and then it was neighbours, and then home and away, and then heartbreak high, and then it was like a whole. No, yeah, that was like my whole um, night planned out, um, kicking off with ready, steady, cook, At and four thirty. Yeah, four thirty, <laughs> just ready. Had all my snacks lined up, um, and I just, I really liked then, and I really like now. Um, the camaraderie aspect of cooking. I actually really also agree. Like, I love Delia because you feel safe with her and she's kind and she doesn't shout. Well, there's no one there to shout at. <laughs> but what I liked about um, Ready, Steady, Cook is, is that everyone's quite kind and even when things mess up, everyone's laughing with you. I find sometimes cooking... I want to relax my cookery shows, not get stressed out because I'm sort of like, you know, containing my anxiety levels. Um, but I just think my favourite part of it, sorry, my favourite part of it was actually not the main segment, it was the bit where they shook out the mystery bag, which I always thought was, was really excellent. And it, it, um, I loved how people had different takes on it. And then do you remember people voted which, which one they wanted to see happen? And then the losing chef had to help the winning chef do it. So I always thought that was quite fun. Brilliant. Well, let's, let's grab a, a clip of that, please. We've got some lovely uh, white chocolate there, guys, high in cocoa solids, along with blueberries. 90% of these are actually produced in the United States of America. I love that show. Um, <laughs> next up, Nisha, you've got one of my favourites, I believe. I have the, 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 the one of the shows I love the most is is Floyd doing anything, but it's the <laughs> for, it's the format of Chop and Chat, you know, and it's almost uh, something that people don't really talk about in the commissioning rooms. It's kind of, people are kind of overlooking it, I think, at the moment, Chop and Chat. But for me, it's the most ancient, time-tested way that you learn to cook, and I suppose it's as you say, Tanya, you come to TV with different expectations and different itches that need scratching, and the ultimate warm bath for me is that didactic, somebody with gnarled hands, someone like my dad who's pissed teaching you how to cook a <laughs> lamb curry, you know, a bottle of Johnny Walker later, um, which is the Keith Floyd. Uh, you know, but, but all of that, that really avuncular, warm intimacy that you get from a chop and chat is, I think, for many of the people that I know, once you've done a day's work, that's how you zone out, and that's how you actually learn a little bit. And when you combine a bit of travel into that, it's just the perfect, perfect uh, end for an evening, I think. Yeah, wicked. Um, I, I fully agree with that as well. I, I think especially with the alcoholic element of it, the yeah. ability that <laughs> yeah. something could go yeah. wrong or there's going to be a faux pas. And like talking to camera as well, because it draws you in. It's just so, oh, it's so exactly. nimble, yeah, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we've got a clip of Keith doing what he does. This is a Floyd programme and we always cook in lemonade, as you know. One of the most essential things is going to be a bottle of good, strong red wine, because you'll probably need half a bottle to go into the, uh, into the dish itself, and you're going to need half a bottle to go into yourself to make things really cheerful. Superb. Um, and finally, Sarah, given your, you know, your track record of some incredible TV programmes, what's been most Yeah, I feel, I feel a bit like it's a shameless plug now, and I don't mean to be, uh, yeah, for yeah. it to be that, but, <laughs> but I felt like we are, you know, I think, I agree with all these guys, you know, Delia is the dawn of things, Ready, Steady, Cook is one of the original formats of food, and, and Floyd is that sort of charismatic person that you host, but you've all sort of touched on that sort of atmosphere thing, and I feel like um, I'm going to talk about Bake Off, because there's a reason I think it has gone on so long, there's a reason why it came to Channel 4 post-BBC, and that is it's a, it's a format that really works, but more than that, it's an atmosphere. Like, I think it's sort of no secret, I don't think it was commissioned immediately by the BBC, and if you actually think about it, it seems a bit... A bit, a bit weird that you're going to cook in a tent, but it's sort of evocative of every celebration that you've ever had. And those bakers are, it's sort of a reality show without reality show in it. You know, it's quiet drama. It's a look here, it's a look there. Half those people are surgeons by day, but not just come and they just, they're an incredible baker because that's what they do to relax. That's their sort of float zone to calm down. So, um, and I think, you know, it's, it's amazing that it is, it, it's, come over to us successfully and people still tune in. It's still appointment to view. And for that, I feel like 
because it's presenting an atmosphere and people are coming to it, I feel like that's why it's quite influential. So this is a clip of uh, Vegan Week from last year, which <laughs> some people liked, some people didn't. But I think um, that we've got is an ability to reflect what's going on in, in the world. But there's a loveliness about the way the bakers bond and come together and, and the drama that cake making can create. <laughs> Brilliant. B, can you help me put yeah, this yeah, on? Yeah. I'm scared. You've got dowels in there, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, then it'll be fine. I don't think that's gonna. Uh oh. <sighs> Cake stand is Del Boy's suitcase. Brilliant. Who, who would have thought there could have been so much tension and drama from uh, from a cake? <laughs> Which I guess uh, leads me on to my next question. You know, in this day of digital, uh, you know, social media, YouTube, watching, scrolling, Facebooking, why are we so obsessed with cookery shows when we're cooking less than ever? Um, I'll give that one to Sarah and Tanya. I think um, I think because it's it, it brings people together, right? It, it's collaborative, it's creative, it brings cultures together. But I think it's again, I think it comes back to that. It's like people like watching food as a mood, and I think it is escapism in, in a world where you're allowed permission to indulge. It, it's it, it looks delicious. You so it just it's a safe. And what, like all of the examples, they're all quite warm and positive things, aren't they? And I think they're just quite an easy thing to escape into, um, uh, you know, and indulge, right? Yeah, I think that's right. And I think that, you know, actually, I mean, it might sound like an obvious point, but we all have to eat all the time. So in a way, whatever the fashion is, for whether it's chop and cook or sped up little videos on social media or, um, you know, whatever it is, we always have a need to eat and therefore will always have an enjoyment, I think, of watching food programmes. And if you look at MasterChef, which we make, you know, we make three different series every year. Um, and unlike almost every other format on terrestrial television, it's actually doing better uh, year on year and growing, which is sort of extraordinary when you look generally at kind of the what, you know, what audiences are doing. And I think it's just because there's a sort of reassurance in a format that people love, that they, that they can rely on. And it's, you know, it's different to, I don't think people necessarily go home and try and recreate MasterChef recipes, but they really enjoy the familiarity of it and the quality of it. And, you know, as I said, the audience is growing, which is very unusual yeah, for a format these days. And, 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 you know, we saw the clip of uh, Ready, Steady, Cook a little bit earlier, which is, for me, one of the first food shows that really engaged me just because it made cooking accessible. And fun. And fun. Yeah. You know, it, it was just fun characters and, and there was that competition element, the, that drama. So, you know, how, how important is the competition element? Um, and again, I'll, I'll leave that with yourself, Tanya and Sarah, um, in, in food formats. Um, I think that what's interesting about British audiences is British audiences like good food. So whatever the format that most programs that work involve good food whilst actually if you look at other countries like I mean MasterChef now plays in 32 countries and it was really interesting looking at what works in each country you see that for example in Italy their most successful new challenge last year was when they had to uh, design and create some dog food and then oh. had a load of dogs come into the audience <laughs> uh, into the studio well. to judge the quality of the dog food. Oh, well. And they just loved it. Now, we could never do that. In, it would not go down well with the British audience who love it. Um, so I think there's a, I think there's a real um, position for both, uh, for competitions and the more kind of chef-led um, formats like, you know, Floyd or Rick Stein or Mary Berry or some of the, you know, yourself. Um, but I think also you, Sarah was saying about Bake Off it keeps coming back. And again, I'm not going to just talk about MasterChef tonight, but we do have a little clip, which I just think is interesting in seeing how if you would evolve a format in the right way, it can move with the audience. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I know I grew up watching Lloyd Grossman uh, with MasterChef, and that show was a very, very different one to the show that it is now. But unfortunately, it wasn't me, but a very good, clever team of people managed to kind of you know, modernise it and bring it up to date, and which is, again, one of the reasons it goes from strength to strength. Indeed. And, I mean, Sarah, do you have anything to, to add? Yeah, any, any further insight? I think I agree with all of that. I think it's... Um, I think characters are 
are quite key, whether they Absolutely. are presenting characters or whether they are, I mean, the bakers are the star of, of, of that. And when you invest in them and you look at the sort of vignettes you get and things like street food on Netflix, that's, you're buying into somebody who utterly lives, breathes and, you know, believes in this kind of uh, food. But I do think you need a cracking format with that, whether that's competition, you know, or, you know, I think in a world where you can get recipes online, chop and chat shows traditionally are, are harder to cut through. I think you come to them if there's a huge dawn leading them or you might want something, some other element from that, whether that's travel to get inspiration to cook the food. But I think the instructional one is harder. So I think competition ones are easier to, because you're investing in the character who Absolutely. you are then driving through. I think as a viewer, you can almost kind of see yourself as that person on screen as well. And, you know, they're their highs and lows, their, their journey, particularly the Bake Off or a, or a Master Chef, where I love watching that trucker from Middlesbrough who's whipping up some incredible food and, and you can kind of almost place yourself as that person and anyone can be that person. Yeah, and I think also even the best chefs can have a disaster yes. in the kitchen. Absolutely. So the kind of drama around cooking is actually, you know, it's sort of tenser than any other yeah. sort of talent yeah. show because actually a good singer... Yeah, they might get sore throat on the day, but a good singer is probably always going to be good, but an amazing chef can just kind of completely mess and it up on the, the day. And it's the pressure of those competitions, <laughs> yeah. which is great, because exactly they can destroy the greatest baker or, or chef um, by doing that. You How know, important can... is that disaster element to you no, guys? No, no, no. It's like you don't, you, Formula you, One you, you, just you, it you for cast the for the best... You can ask for the best, right? But it's but it's 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 interesting that you know a level of experience and maturity sometimes gets people further because they're used to the pressure of the you know it's the pressure of the kitchen, right? It's the heat is heat is on in the kitchen, and that has been the perennial basis for lots of the creations of lots of sort of food formats. I think. Brilliant. Well, we've got a, a Master Chef clip, which is uh, which probably really demonstrates the point. Fantastic. So, you know, I think uh, that showed really well how one TV format has moved along the ages. And similarly, I think I'm going to fire this over to you, Melissa. Um, over the years, we've had, we've seen the transition from really factual 1950s cookery programs to the 80s, where you've got international culture, mm -hmm. your Floyds, your Mother Jeffries, uh, and now we're more socially conscious. Um, so we've got a lot more sort of, I guess, vegetarian food and environmentally friendly and all this kind of stuff. Um, does food pro programming set the agenda or reflect it? What do you say? Oh, God, that's a big, big question. Why have I got this one? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think it is, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I always enjoy TV where I'm learning something new and um, I love, you know, Jimmy and Jamie's for that. I really enjoy TV where I can see, where I can learn something about, I don't know, uh, you know, looking at, for example, Lloyd, what he was doing just then, you know, he's using a, an unpopular cut of meat um, and he's, he, it looks a little bit bizarre because we're not used to seeing it, but I, I like anything where, where it's not just absolutely um, unctuous, as he says, and like <laughs> completely delicious and all that food porn element, but you're really understanding why you should cook that dish over a million others. Um, environmentally friendly wise, I think uh, I'm, I'm really, just, you know, I was, um, when Jazz and I did our TV show, I wish if we had done it again or if we had had, you know, any say at all, <laughs> it being our first TV show, didn't really have any say. But um, the bits that I most enjoyed filming were, um, I think we filmed the whole thing in, it was 10 episodes in 10 days. I mean, we had no idea what we were doing. And it was actually uh, commissioned by an Australian TV show, so, uh, channel. So actually when we first got the email, we thought we were going to Sydney to film it. <laughs> <laughs> and in the end, it, were, it was not Sydney. Um, but the bits that I most enjoyed, we did five days with um, a father and son, uh, quinoa farmers in Essex, uh, a biodynamic uh, apple and chicken uh, um, farm in Kent. And unfortunately, those bits got really cut down, but they were the most interesting stories that were being told. Um, and I think maybe, you know, now, I think we might have had a better chance of those stories being shown. It's the people behind it, the connection that they have. Um, I also love any Hugh Fanny Whittingstall show. Anything that is actually 
showing me something that I'm not going to see in a supermarket. Um, the whole wonky veg, ugly veg, you know, what can I do with peelings? Um, you know, I'm not vegan or vegetarian, but I'm always interested in, in, in understanding what I can cook for my friends and, um, yeah, I, anything I'm, I'm just re I, I'm really into and I wish there was more shows where, I don't know, can there be more shows where the farmers are cooking the meal? I, I always love asking my butcher or fishmonger yeah, yeah. what they're having for dinner. Yeah. I think that's, um, is that, has that ever been a show? Can Most we do that? that? <laughs> I mean, they know their produce best yeah. and um, they know how to get the most out of it. So uh, I, think, I think we'll be seeing a lot more of that. I hope we will anyway, but how to get more. And, and I think any show that's got any thrifty tips, um, what's the one called with Chris Babb and cooking? Cook eat, eat Well For Less. Eat Well For Less. I think that's a great show. Excellent. Um, do we have any shows coming through, Sarah, or something like that, or any kind of bits like that where sort of setting the agenda? Oh, I, th I think, I mean, we're always, off, we're always on the lookout for new food shows. I mean, it's the perennial, as, as Tanya says, we all eat. So, you know, it's Food Network. People, people are never going to get tired of, of food, but I think it's how you, um, how you use talent, how you look at format and competition, how you innovate around it and reflect the world. I mean, there is this whole sort of food porn, Instagram world of yeah. cronuts and rainbow bagels. And then uh, on the other hand, there's the, you know, the kind of the instructional type of cooking or the, or the food issues that you're picking up on, which, you know, covering things like food unwrapped or, or the eat well for like, So there's, there's so many aspects to food, but it's always about how are you, how, how's it going to cut through actually and, how, and what is going to make something appointment to view, I think. So I think also there's a, there's a there's the kind of agenda of what we're interested in, and I think you're right. People are interested more, increasingly interested mm. in vegetarianism, veganism, um, sustainability, all of these things. But I think that certainly when I was commissioning, and I'm sure it's the same for Sarah now, when you're commissioning programs, you always want to commission programs that people want to watch rather than programs that people feel they should watch. Yeah. So when when well, for us when we're trying to come up with ideas for new food shows and I think for Sarah and other channels when they're looking for them you're looking for sort of almost sm smuggling in those things so that people are watching it because it's going to be great food or great talent or they're going to a great country but then sort of underneath you, you, you get all the other things that you're talking about but as a headline I think it's quite hard to get audiences to engage with those subjects. And I think there was, I think there was a, a, a pack of people that people trust. It's 20 years since Jamie did The Naked Chef. You sort of, you understand what, what these people are, but I think it's, it's interesting you watch that MasterChef, that cogitate, digest, whatever. Like, mm -hmm. it, the catchphrases or the vernacular around these sort of atmospheres and bubbles, you know, ready, set, bake, it's, you know, it, it, it becomes these sort of, you know, these, these sort of things where you know that Gordon is, you know, hot pan oil. You always do your hot pan for your oil. You know what you know what they stand for. And I think the the shows that cut through are when you've got a great chef who who you know what their food is. You know visually what it is. You know you know what you're buying into. You know what you're you know you're coming to. Jamie sort of changed the way men got in the kitchen. Right, I started cooking. My, my you know my husband cooks everything, and it's all from just what it was just an easy way to learn. Or then if you want you know a smarter dish, you go to a different type of chef. I think the more the more the character of their food is in line with their character, then you, I think they're, they're the sort of experts that seem to cut through. I think the trust things. element is quite important. I think they trust on there yeah. as well. Uh, uh, you know, someone like Jamie, where people of my generation, I grew up with Jamie and, and I still trust him. And when I watch Jimmy's Friday night show, whatever, and he slips in those little sustainable stories and really cool stories of little farmers, I kind of, I believe in it because I grew up yeah. with him, um, uh, you know, doing things like that um so yeah i think that 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 trust element is 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 huge um and even bake off where we saw vegan week again it's, it's you know people now trust the format enjoy the format and you've kind of slipped in this vegan cakes can be great as well guys um uh, which i'm sure they are um <laughs> Yeah, again, though, I think it's, you know, the world, I think, was sort of ready for Jamie. Delia was amazing, yeah. but it, it, it was all kind of, right, you put your boiled egg in your, your sorry, your raw egg <laughs> in cold water and you put it on for precisely three and a half minutes and then the world was ready for Jamie just going, well, let's have a handful of this and a spoon of that. Yeah, and yeah. and I, he, he brought a whole new audience, I think, to cookery programmes. Yeah, but Delia is still super, super influential, isn't she? Like, over Christmas, when she 
talks yeah, about one things, ingredient, the, yeah. the key ingredient, uh, D Delia and Nigella, they talk about their key ingredient at key times of the year, and Waitrose just sells out in, in half a day. So mm -hmm. they still have kind of huge influences. But, you know, talk of influences, uh, Nisha, in restaurant culture, you know, again, is it... Is, is restaurant culture being driven by TV, or, or is it the other way around? Do you look to what's happening on TV when you're expanding your empire? I think it's almost an extrapolation of the question before. I, I think it's very much the other, I think it's the other way around. I think um, the speed that we go as consumers, uh, you know, people going out on the street, we, we are constantly inundated with ideas about food and the way that we should eat and the way that we should treat our bodies and how sacrosanct all of that is. And every time you walk through Soho, there's a new groundbreaking, fabulous way of eating. London's the best city in the world, I think, for food. If it's happening in a weird village in Peru, it's happening on the streets of Soho somewhere. Um, and so I don't, think, I don't think you could possibly commission programmes at the speed that we as consumers on the street evolve in terms of our food. So I think it's, it's always the way... I think it's exactly as you say, Tanya. I think what TV does is then produce something that provides a comfortable place for us as those middle-class <laughs> food intelligentsia to come and sit and unwind and think this is a safe and noble place for me. So if you're dealing with veganism, it's because I'm doing veganism every day at lunchtime, you know, in the high street. So I, I, I don't see the relationship at all, you know, and I build restaurants, I don't see the relationship between TV and restaurants. And I tell you, I think that's quite a nice clinical division. It's quite a handy one, especially when you see what's happening now with Jamie and the restaurants. And, you know, what is that nexus? Is there a nexus? Yeah. Is your, the success of your restaurant dependent on how good you are on TV as a presenter, et cetera, and all of those things? You know, for me, that's a, it's a terrifying line to tread yeah. because if you're only as good as your last performance, then your entire empire, and it's not the case. They're two completely separate things. Also, I think what you want to watch being cooked or what you even want to cook yourself isn't necessarily what you want to eat when you... Totally. Go out. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, Absolutely. So, I mean, you know, Chinese food is incredibly popular uh, to go out and eat. And, I mean, there was a period where everybody had a walk and everybody <laughs> yeah. was... But, you know, apart from that, it's quite, you know, it's quite quite a difficult cuisine for people to really get to grips with. So, so I agree. I think the two things are, are different. And I think you need an entry point into TV. If, that, if you're not going for the escapism or the competition or the people or the characters, like, then, you, you know, there's a reason 15-minute meals was good or even quick and easy, it's five ingredients. It's the, already said, it's the same thing. You kind of go, oh, I could do that. But, you know, I think that this, the simpler the concept, actually, the more they cut through. Uh, and, you know, the, the big-name chefs are still kind of drawing in the, the crowds on TV, your Gordons, your Jamies. <laughs> Uh, Nadia's Mary Berry, you know, how important is that big name chef? Um, uh, particularly, as, as, as Nisha said, how quickly the restaurant scene moves and how, how quickly trends within uh, actually restaurants and, and food moves. You know, how, how, how important is that big name chef for you guys? Uh, Tanya? Do you mean for t a TV, for TV for, format? For a TV yeah. format. I think it really depends. Um, I, think, I think the Bake Off is a really good example of how. Um, no talent actually is bigger than the format. Um, and I think, you know, there were a lot of people who said that Bake Off could never move. And, you know, Bake mm. Off was Mary, Mel and Sue. And it was a big part of why people watched Bake Off. But people are now watching Bake Off with a very different flavour and different talent. So I think it is important in getting people to watch a programme. But I think the format itself is, is often more important. Absolutely. Yeah. Sorry. I th I, I, you obviously I, I, work I mean, with Jamie yeah, yeah. And, and, and all uh, a lot of the big name chefs. Yeah. So, you know, and I was, what um, could we convince you to get someone? You know, uh, I think unknown? it's. I think it's. I think there's so many great chefs out there, and so many of them online. And I think it is. It is hard to cut through in a quite crowded landscape. And uh, I think uh, you know, as an individual, like I'm saying, an individual shop and chat, because people want more because they can go and find that online. They don't want to come. So they need a reason to be coming to TV that, that needs to be possibly a bit bigger than that. But it, it comes back to your point about trust, right? So, and, and you know, when we, we got the Bake Off and it was like, oh my goodness, who do you replace Mary with? And, you know, actually that was an easier thing than the hosts because it's about experience and, you know, you can't argue with 50 years of experience from Pru and, and you just you just can't. Like you, <laughs> you, it's incomparable, really, with other people and then, you know, and the respect they have for, for each other. So I think it is, it, is, it is about that trust and, 
And I still, I, th I also think it's about that, t it's a tone, it's what can I identify with? Do, who is this? What are they making? What am I buying into? So. Interesting. Um, you know, talking of new talent, you know, we look at social media and uh, the speed at which social media channels are growing, uh, say from YouTube to Facebook, food channels, recipes, people are sharing, people are growing audiences. Um, what can television learn from social media um, that, you know, uh, to, to keep television current? Um, probably one for Nisha and, and Melissa who have grown your audiences and kind of developed your, your following through social media. For, for me, I think they are, again, I think they're so different. It's a really profound question because you think social media is this great, you know, marching panacea and it, make, it, it and it has all the answers and it is such a different thing. So I do all my social media, all the restaurant social media and it is fascinating. So what, and I monitor the reaction to every single one of my food posts and, and, and see what resonates and what doesn't. And what they want is they want something that's still and glistening and oozing and come hither <laughs> and achievable. And so it's not so much the micro herving stat, you know, they want something that's familiar and familial almost. So those are the things that get the biggest hits and that's where you get the conversation saying, can we go to this restaurant and get this immediately? All of that kind of thing. Nothing compares to TV. Nothing. I, I think nothing compares to TV. That live interaction, be it in the format that you're talking about, the competition format. I think that's an interesting point though. I think the competition format, you go with a different mind. I watch Bake Off and I watch MasterChef because I'm watching the, the arcs of the people. I want to immerse myself in them and see how they develop. But the hardcore food thing, I would go. My, my, I would go to the chop and shots. You know, I was watching the Harry Bikers before I came out to this this evening. <laughs> you know, to see how you make a baguette or whatever. Um, and, and nothing compares to that. So if you do a bunny chow on Sunday brunch, you know, a six-minute segment, I will sell out for the next six <laughs> six weeks of bunny chow. So there is, they are so disparate. You know, and you think I think somebody was talking about Joe Suggs being one of those few you know, bloggers that actually makes it onto TV and, and, and not massively successfully either. You know, they're, they, they're, they tap into two very different parts of the brain and different kinds of people, I think. Yeah, it's one of the few areas, I think, where they really complement one, one another rather than take away from one, one another. And my, I know that, you know, I go, I get a lot of recipes online but it doesn't stop me buying the books and it doesn't stop me watching the television programmes because there's so much pleasure from just having a cookery book or from watching the programme. Um, and I watch a lot of those. I love those sort of sped up. Um, little tasty. Tasty things yeah. Yeah, or the, you, the, uh, constantly on my sort of various social media yeah. feeds. Yeah. And I love them, but it, it, but it doesn't, in, it's in addition to my love of watching programmes and buying the books. It's, it's very much lifestyle, isn't it? It you is, know. but it's interesting because book sales are at the highest. There is yes, no abating, absolutely. no abating book sales. Yeah. So you realise that that, again, is something that is not influenced at all by people still want to go to that, that, that ancient way of doing things, which is almost like an ap apothecary, you know, this alchemy of turning a page and you see a picture of something and you cook it. There is something ancient about the way that we want to learn to cook and that comes from books and it comes from intimacy. But I think. you're right, it's the aesthetics, right? Yeah. So, so you know, online or in a book or in there. I mean, if you've ever seen a cut of a show, which I have, no names mentioned, where they've not done that macro pass, where they've not done the sumptuous, gorgeous, mm -hmm. with the beautiful lenses that really make you salivate, it's terrible. It doesn't translate. And mm -hmm. you don't, you don't, it doesn't make you, it doesn't feel delicious. So you don't want to watch it. <laughs> um, it's true, actually. I, I, it's interesting you say that, because actually I know... Uh, you know, making cookery programs is actually a real specialty, and good cookery programs look very easy to make. And I've come across a lot of people recently who aren't used to making food programs, who have sort of gone, oh, you know, how hard can it be? And then sort of got to their edit and gone, oh, we sort of <laughs> forgot to, we forgot to film the food. They sort of forget that the food is the kind of hero of the show. Absolutely. And actually, a good cookery program looks easy, but it, you know, there's a lot of thought that goes into how to how to create something that people want to watch. And then you look at the schedule of a recording day of any food programme. Those, those, that takes up a huge chunk of time if it's going to resonate. It I was going to say as well, I just, um, it's just taking me all back now to when we were filming it. I remember, uh, you know, just having to be very quiet for a while. Well, a long while so that, you know, the cameras, the sound could pick up the sizzling. And because I think actually when there's two of you, you think it makes it easier, but actually it's harder because you, I remember one recipe, uh, it was 
slow cooked chicken curry. So the chicken just went in the slow cooker. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and the director who did Nigel Slater's and like Nigella's was like, where's the drama? And like, what's, she, and she was like, well, wait, don't put it all in. Cause I need to think about how I'm going to make this all exciting. And we're like, well, that's kind of our recipe. It just goes in the slow cooker. And they was like, so they're like, so there's nothing that's going to sizzle. No, there's nothing that's going to get like all nice and golden. No, it's just going to look quite ugly in the slow cooker, but it's going to taste amazing. And I remember, yes, yeah, stopping for, for the sizzles, the, 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 all the senses. And when I think about when I'm on my phone, you know, say you're, say you're waiting for the overground and you're thinking about what to have for dinner. Yeah, that might really inspire you, whatever just flashed up. But actually, when you're at home and consuming sort of in your own life, because I guess like nine to five or eight to six is your working day, when you're actually having you time, you've got a glass of wine in hand or a, um, a mug of tea, or you've got your dinner in your hand, you're on the sofa. I don't want to be on my phone. I don't want to be scrolling. I don't want little one minute things. I actually want to be enveloped in something and I want all the sounds and um, I don't have surround sound. I don't know why I did that, but <laughs> I want the sound and I, I and I want to feel like I'm smelling it all. So but, I think that is, yeah, yeah, super important. A dub of a, a food show is absolutely key. A really good dub of a lemon squeeze through to, it, a yeah. sizzle through to, it's, yeah. it's really important. That to cheese, translate. that Parmesan cheese. Totally. <laughs> totally. Um, you know, and so we're looking for, you're looking for new talent, uh, still staying in this kind of social media realm. You know, uh, how, how closely do you look at social media channels and, and uh, how do they get your attention and do they even want to be on TV, actually? Have you come across, you know, situations where you've approached someone and they said, actually, we're, we're all right, we're, we're, we're building our own channel over here and, and we're fine, thank you. Um, Tanya and, and Sarah. I, I think I, you. yeah, I mean, I think I probably get a email a day about people going, oh, have you, here's a new bit of talent, here's, and, and it's, it's, and before I did this job, that, that department is always inundated with people who are doing, you know, coming up with different ways of doing food. But I think, I mean, I, I think themes translate more, like, I think it's really, I think to come across great new talent is, it's just quite a saturated world, so it's how you build that profile and what you build them in and, you know, how, how you make them cut through because otherwise they're doing a great job doing what they're doing where they are and people are finding them where they are. So I think... Um, but I think there's, there's definitely, like, all those trends coming through, you know, all of that sort of... the chop, Just chopping in itself is a thing, isn't it? And all the, the kind of art, art, art form of, of food is... I think those th subjects get reflected within food programmes, but... I yeah, think, I think as we said before, I think the two things are quite different and there, is, there isn't a history of anyone, actually any kind of massive blogger or social media star translating effectively on, into television. Mm. I did mention before when we were backstage about Joe Suggs, but even that, that was, you know, that was very different, um, being on Strictly is a sort of different thing. Um, and I know when we're looking for new talent, we've sort of learnt just by... It's sort of experience in trying to pitch ideas to broadcasters that actually when you, you can find someone who's got a massive social media following and they're amazing and they've got an amazing product, but when you get into the, well, why, uh, why does a channel want to commission them and what is the programme, it's quite hard to think of a really good sell. Um, and there sort of needs to be something else now about why a, pro a programme's commissioned or why people want to watch. It's not enough just to have a big social media following. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's not just across food, I'd say. I mean, that, yeah. that is generally vlogger... Like, it's, it's a, you know, you get... It's, it's the last few years, I think Joe is quite a rare rare case of, of you know, on a, on a huge show on Saturday night. So I think that's... Yeah. Like you say, the world can coexist and we cross-pollination sometimes, but... I guess a lot of social media channels, they're, they're quite focused on what they do as well, whereas TV is, has to uh, um, attract a wider audience. So, and, and engage for and more than 30 seconds. Exactly. It's a, it's a completely different skill set. Um, totally. I mean, for, for ages, Jamie's been doing the, the BuzzFeeds, the cut-downs of it, hands-only yeah. food prep, you know, and was doing that sort of long before, <laughs> you know, people were doing... So, I, I, exactly, people know the different, different marketplaces, I guess. Exactly, and uh, we've got a, uh, a cool clip, the tasty clip. Um, this should whet everyone's appetite if, if it isn't already. Uh, if anyone's seen this, this is the, um, the lasagna fried thing, which is uh, quite complex. 
compelling watching whilst we're whilst that's on in the background. So you know, Netflix is really really flying in the in the cookery title world. Uh, you know, you've got Chef's Table, nailed it. Salt, fat, acid, um, street food, which is which I'm loving at the moment. Um, uh, you know, uh, what has been the impact on uh, on on Netflix for you guys? Um, again, sort of Sarah and Tanya, and even even for for Melissa and, and Nisha, is that, you know, are you looking? looking at that as an opportunity. I think there's some I mean, some incredible Netflix programming full stop, right? But you know, things like street uh, street food and chef's table, that there we wouldn't commission those commission those for eight PM on channel four. We need more format, we need more takeout. They are you you wouldn't go to watch those, I don't think, necessarily at 8 p.m. They're beautiful vignettes of people who are living and breathing dons of food that are incredibly aspirational, but they wouldn't, that, that's too lyrical. It wouldn't cut through with our audiences at 8 p.m. Um, and, and it'd probably be something we'd make out of arts or documentaries, actually, that sort of stuff. But something like Nailed It, absolutely. It's got a great format. It's got, it's got the triumphs and the lows. It's, you know, an entertaining take on sort of features TV. And I think, yeah, I think that's moved the dial on in, in a good way, things like programs like that, you know, and your eight-year-olds are finding it or you know, or, or you're grown-ups, and I think that when you can find formats that bring a wide audience, I think that's pretty key. I'm just too hungry now. so dry. Go home. It's normally at this point in the video, up until sort of about 20 seconds ago, I was totally going to make that, and then it's always the last 20 seconds that makes me think I'm not going to. This has um, been seen 56 million times, I think, this, uh, this video. It's the most watched video. Wow. I wonder tasting. how much it costs to put together. Um, this is how much they made from it. Yes. Uh, I mean, for us as a business, I think Netflix um, provides more opportunities. Uh, as I said earlier, interestingly, MasterChef as a format doesn't seem to be suffering uh, because there's there are more <coughs> options of things to watch on Netflix. So, yeah, for us, it just is another place that we can pitch ideas uh, where it's exciting that, they're, that cookery shows are doing well because... It's you know it's a crowded marketplace and it's mm. sometimes you do scratch your head and think is there another original idea or is there another angle in um, and I think what Netflix have shown with some of those formats is yes there is and um, I think also it's interesting just seeing you, you nailed it especially is such a kind of brash way of you know the, the presenter is like incredibly brash and funny and. I think that was really sort of brave and it really, really works. And you, there aren't, I'm not sure that a British broadcaster would take that sort of risk, but I think having seen that succeed on Netflix, maybe they will. So I think creatively, it's a bit like that thing that apparently if a hairdresser opens next to another hairdresser, the original hairdresser does better. So I think that it's like the more food programs that work, actually the better it is for everyone because the more it sort of increases people's appetite rather than the other way, way around. Well, we've got a clip of Nailed It, um, if we can get that on. Put on your brave face and start baking! Bake, what is wrong with you? Oh, no. What happened? You've got everything there, haven't you? I mean, that is ultimate car crash TV. It's like the generation game. I mean, that's yeah. what you're watching it for. It's that thing, isn't it? It's Absolutely. like you don't care what the food You've got is. drama, personalities, and disaster guaranteed yeah. at the end of it. It's got joy, though, and I think a lot yeah. of food programming has joy in it. It's yeah. sort of we're laughing about it. You, when do you make... I mean, obviously, you guys do all the time, but, you know, you, you're often making food for someone you love or a birthday cake, or it's, it's got that sort of sense of, oh, my God, this could be a complete disaster, but it's, it's, it's joyous and it's fun escapism, I think. And, Fantastic. Well, look, um, where do we go from here? You know, cookery formats are, as we said, topping the charts. Um, and, you know, the, the, the crucial 16 to 34 audience is massively engaged. But uh, we've spoken about social media, impact of social media, digital mm -hmm. channels, Netflix, etc. cetera. Um, where, do, where does terrestrial food formats go next? Uh, for everyone, what would, you know. Uh, I think I think bluntly, like food see? food always rates. It's great. Everybody always needs to eat. It's always about how you innovate. I think you can make food program for everyone. We've got some amazing cornerstones in our schedule now of like the Bake Offs or the Food on Rats, looking at issues or the ja you know the Jamies. But I feel like there's room for other stuff. We're going to do something about Jamie. Twenty years on this year, he's going to do a 
uh, a new vegetarian series because everyone's wanting to go meat free. Like, so I feel like you can you you have experts that are doing that, but I still feel like there's there's room for this 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 new generation of Instagramming kind of food shows. So I feel, yeah, I think it's it's just always about what's the original idea that will cut through. Fantastic, Tanya. Anything? I mean, how are you? You know, sixteen to thirty-four year olds are switching off from regular TV. Um, how do we keep them on, and uh, what are you what are you guys doing to or keep them engaged in normal TV formats, just sitting down, keeping their attention for half an hour at a time? I think it's always about finding the right thing and the right form. I mean, again, it, you know, actually, MasterChef's real family viewing, and um, the sixteen thirty four audience is also going up, which again sort of bucks the trend and wouldn't necessarily be what I'd expect. Um, but I think it's sort of like Sarah said, you're just constantly looking at how to innovate and I think that young people don't sit and watch TV but they do still consume content mm. and so it's just about I think trying to come up with ideas that maybe can be viewed in different ways so that they appeal to different audiences so for example last the last series of MasterChef we also made a load of sort of films that were much more kind of for Instagram and Facebook and um, <coughs> Snapchat and things like that, and that you know that those were consumed really heavily by 16, 34 year olds, but we weren't alienating the sort of more traditional audience. So I think it's about being broad yeah. and creative in the way you approach things to just try and kind of keep everyone in because it's very easy to get obsessed by 16, 34 year olds because it's the future, but there are also a lot of other people watching television and, and consuming, and you sort of you, you want to keep them sort of in the in the fold as well. So, so when you're um, when you're kind of looking at new formats, new shows, when you sit down, you have your your big meeting. Does part of it say what does our digital strategy look like for the show? Yeah, like, absolutely. Is, you know, uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, and what what kind of things are you looking for from? Well, I think what's interesting is the question for us is always what is the digital strategy and what are you trying to achieve from that digital strategy because. It's quite hard, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but it's quite hard to know if digital strategy drives viewers to a programme, but it's incredibly important in terms of including the younger audience and brand awareness. And so it's sort of, there, there is a digital strategy. I think um, when we develop ideas, I think broadcasters are a little bit behind the curve um, in that... Generally, you know, certainly at the BBC, for example, you know, the TV people commission TV and then there isn't really kind of any budget for a digital strategy. So sometimes these things fall between two stools. But I think going forwards and if we're going to be clever about television and making sure that we still keep serving a really broad audience, the, the two things have to be kind of connected. You've got to find the budget. If you appreciate the power Absolutely. of it, then the budget should be there because it kind of pays for itself. Absolutely. But again, it sort of comes down to what is what you're trying to achieve from that strategy. Mm. Um, and different audiences want different things from the from the content. Brilliant. Um, and anything you guys can share? Sarah, what's what's coming up? What have you got? Yeah, I think I've spoken up? about those things that are coming. There was this the, we have got lots of things in development and you know, we're we're always interested in food format. So I think, you know, I think we've got some key things coming up. So <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> any, any, any insight? Any, any sneak peeks? I'm peaks? trying to sell lots of food formats. <laughs> <laughs> to lots of people. Um, no, I mean, I have to say, MasterChef keeps us quite busy. We also do um, things with Mary Berry, and we, and we are starting to look at, you know, new talent and just how do you? We get very excited by new talent because, also, these things are cyclical. And so, Sarah's absolutely right. And I think if the if you had a representative from the BBC here or Five or ITV, they would be saying the same thing. But then every so often, there is the next Jamie or there is the next person that does really capture the nation's imagination because they feel really passionately about a, an issue that is, you know, feels of the moment or just because they're really extraordinary in terms of their character. There's just something. So you never stop looking for that person. So I'm just going to carry on trying to find the next Jamie and when I've done that I'll retire. <laughs> um, brilliant. Um, I think that's that's it for from the panel. Um, questions? Um, lady at the front here, I think we've got a mic. 
Hi there, uh, my name is Victory Fasai. I'm just a final year student at Westminster studying television production, and I'm also a former contestant of last year's um, Family Cooking Showdown. Um, so I just wanted to ask, um, you were saying talking about social media and um, in the present day how it kind of coexists, but do you reckon like you know like 10, 20 years from now that it that social media could pose a threat to television um, in terms of like its success and how that's growing as well? Uh, Sarah. Um, look, I think I think we are moving towards. A, I think your point about when you were in the BBC a while ago, like the digital, we're moving towards how do we create content? Uh, you know, I think people are quite agnostic at times. I think there are fewer appointment to view programs. People watch what they want when they want from on demand services. We've got we've got the SVODs who are all coming through, and I think people find the content where they want to. I th and um, uh, I mean, I, who knows what that's going to do, but I think we definitely need to be clever about the way we we commission digitally and, you know, and but but the broad appeal thing is really key. Like a great idea or a great piece of talent will always, you know, find viewers um, wherever that is being broadcast, I think. Uh, I mean, how do you guys ensure you've got really interesting people involved, you know, or, or how much effort do you put into kind of the contestant component and... Well, it's huge, you're... right? You've got to find the greatest amateur bakers, and you know, and the but more sure it's on telly, they're the more TV. people want it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, but I, actually, I mean, it's, no, with baking, I think it's not for food programmers. It's absolutely who's the skill. And I think it's that's still, the joy. It's different. They, it's different, and that was my point about reality. They're not. They're not on telly because they want to be on telly. They're on telly because they love baking or cooking, and you know, and actually, that's where you get the joy of someone like Rahul, who. Just, you know, probably would have never, fun. never, it wouldn't have applied for Love Island, would he? So. <laughs> yeah, actually, you know, I mean, you'll, you'll, see pe you'll see people on MasterChef who would not be on any other TV show, yeah. and they're there purely because they're amazing chefs or they're skill based. Amazing, want to be yeah. chefs, and that's absolutely what we're looking for when we when we cast each series. Is it's the food, it's food first always. Absolutely. There's a danger, isn't there, as a consumer, if you attach to somebody that's too much of a charisma in whatever episode three, and then they go, I'm not going to watch it again. So it's kind of nice if they're quieter people in a crazy way. The food does a lot of the talking. Also, our, our presenters would get very cross if <laughs> we presented them with really charismatic people who couldn't cook. Yeah. Uh, they, they, they don't <laughs> like bad food. Different program, isn't it? <laughs> but in a, in a competition format, actually, it's the character of the food they make as well. Like, you know, again, someone like Kim Joy's very distinctive character to her bakes. Like, they, they, they're the characters you can kind of, viewers seem to resonate with, because again, same as the experts. They know what they get getting, or you know yeah. what they're buying into. It stands out. Um, question down here. Um, can I just talk about children's um, uh, cookery TV shows? Um, first of all, to ask Sarah, how uh, my children are delighted that Junior Bake Off is coming back. How are you going to make it your own in the same way that Channel Four has done this with with Bake Off? Um, and also, are there enough? children's cookery shows on TV. Obviously, there's Gordon Rams Ramsay's Daughter. There's shows, you know, that CBeebies have done, like I Can Cook. But are there enough, or is there a certain limit? Um, but it, that might be, a, like, say, where you find the new talent with Gordon's Daughter, who's brilliant. I mean, we're, I've had a meeting today, actually, about Junior Bake Off. It's, we're really excited that that's, that's coming to us. Um, obviously, we're not a children's broadcaster. We're 16 to 34-year-olds um, uh, is our target. But I think we will... You know, we will as ever look to, it's, 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 there's a, there is a format that's there, but there's also a Channel 4 tone, and there's, you know, that's everything through from the challenges, you know, to, there's, there's, there's ways of making it feel, like you say, you know, kind of strong and, and keep, keep going the good that it, that it is. In a, in I think it'd be brilliant to have more kids cookery um, shows. I've got four godchildren and I'm about to start working with um, chefs in schools where literally chefs go into schools and do cooking and I've, I've met a few people. Um, there's one guy who, uh, um, he's a school teacher and he helped build vertical, what am I trying to say, sorry, vertical, what am I trying to say? Veg garden, <laughs> vertical veg garden <laughs> in his school playground, sorry. And um, and I love, and, and one of my favourite things when my god kids come to stay, you know, we make brunch together while their parents have a lion and they absolutely love it and they go to school and um, some of them have got really great options at school and some of them go, that don't have great options go into their schools and ask their teachers if they can have more vegetables. Um, so I think it's brilliant. 
And I, and I, and I think that um, there is so much that kids could be doing in the kitchen. It doesn't have to be the scary, hairy, uh, dangerous jobs. There's so much they can do. And just growing, you know, I learned how to grow cress and boil an egg. That was my whole childhood of cooking because my mum spoilt me. Um, but, but actually, my mum my mom did that because by the time she got home from school and I got home from school, I always had to go to after school clubs and she picked me up. So it's a long story of my child, but you know, she just wanted to get the food on the table and quickly. Um, but if kids could be taught how to cook from a young age, it could be helping their parents out. Um, I think it's it'd be brilliant. It's that relationship? It is the relationship too, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. teach my two year old, I show her a sheet and I go, this is what you're eating now. And yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like we're having barber. Yeah, you should go to nursery. Like, it scares the hell out of the other kids. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> Did you say we're having barber? Oh yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, look, that was great. Um, I think we're we're we're, we're done. Um, hopefully, you, you guys learnt loads, uh, were inspired, and have got loads of ideas afterwards. Just to say, obviously, thank you to the panel uh, for your brilliant insight and your time. Um, Thanks, for, thanks to the RTS uh, for the first of many hopefully successful audiences like this. Um, and yes, thank you all for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.